Uh, thank you so much. It's so good to be with you um, today and to kind of catch you up on what has happened since you have um, invested in us originally. So when we founded, we were um, founded as a 501c3 ministry and started operating in 2011. And we have a three-pronged approach to this ministry and it's prevention. You know, we would love to see a day when ch children are not being trafficked, they're not being bought and sold. Intervention, when we are made aware of a child or a woman, we, we go in and help with uh, law enforcement and whoever's involved, and then the restoration. So Walt will talk about the restoration part because God has worked miracles through the restoration home that's built. Um, <clears throat> so this past decade's been quite a journey for us. And uh, last month, we found ourselves in a very surprising location, and that was at um, sitting on a panel at the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. And I can see the surprise in some of your faces. You could not possibly be more surprised than we were. When I received that invitation, I was telling somebody earlier, I had to check to make sure it wasn't spam, because I thought, really? I don't know why I'm getting invited to do this. But God had just worked through uh, some of our partners that had trained us in the early years, and we had stayed in touch through a lot of these uh, rescues. And so they wanted us to come up and talk about some of the strategies that have been developed and what we're doing here in Augusta. So that was more than I ever could have asked or dreamed, and it was just a surreal moment for our lives. I'm not a speaker, so I had to overcome my fear when we started this of getting up and talking to people about this issue, and I certainly had to overcome a lot of fears. There was a lot of people praying for me that day because I was terrified to walk into those halls with all of those people. And the person who invited me didn't necessarily tell me who all was in the audience, and um, I was glad. I was glad they didn't tell me <laughs> until after it was all over. So um, anyway, I really believe that this ministry started with just a simple prayer. And I would encourage you this morning, never, ever discount the effects of a simple prayer. Because we were on a mission trip in 2000. Nine at the very beginning of 2009, and it was Walter Luke, uh, Luke that's in the sound booth, and myself. And uh, the ministry leader there encouraged us. He said, "If you dare, and if you can really say this and mean it, pray, ask God to break your heart for what breaks His." We were at a place in our life we thought, "Yes, that's what we want to happen. We want you to break our heart for what breaks yours." And we were sincere in that prayer. And so when we came back home about one month after getting back here into Augusta. We met a young girl who had um, run away from our neighborhood, from a home that I had probably walked past a thousand times. She was being abused in that home and had ended up on the streets of Augusta. And she was surviving down there by um, people would give her food, they would give her shelter if she was, was allowed herself to be sexually exploited by them. And, um, you know, I came back immediately and checked out her story, and it was all true, and it broke our hearts. And within the first few months of meeting her, she introduced us to about six more women who had very similar stories. So we started advocating for those women. We never had it in our heart to start a nonprofit or another ministry. We didn't think that was needed. But as we knocked on door after door, made phone call after phone call, we could not find in-depth, sustainable care for women to come out of. They had no skills. Like this child, she had barely, well, she didn't even get her high school degree. She did have a decent education. I mean, she was at the school my children are now at, but she didn't make it through school because of the abuse. So she didn't have that high school diploma, and so she needed so much more, and we just could not find a place. We couldn't find a peg that offered the services that those girls needed. And about that time, uh, Walt had a friend that had been appointed as juvenile judge. So she asked us to come in and sit in her courtroom and listen. So for about six months, we did that. We would go in on Tuesday mornings. She said, I think I'm seeing some of these young mothers come through my courtroom. And after six months, our hearts couldn't take it any longer. She said, I think y'all just need to form a nonprofit. So thankfully, there were people that stepped up to the plate at that time, very generous people like you guys. So in May 2011, uh, the Women of Hope hosted a garden party. Yep, there we are. <laughs> that's my sister. I, I know you know my sister, and that's my daughter, my oldest daughter, and myself, and one of the other members here. And y'all were among one of the first three churches to give us the donations to start this ministry. And so now we're come to report to you with what has happened in these last nine years. It will be nine years in May. And um, we've noticed 
that God kind of led us with a model that was already in the Bible. It's, it's kind of funny how he wrote that down, and if we look into it, we can find models for our lives. But Nehemiah had long been a favorite book of mine. Nehemiah, he was an Old Testament prophet. And as a teenager, he was taken captive from, um, and taken away to um, Persia. And he found himself serving in that captive position, the king. And he was getting word that the, the, his folks, his people back in Jerusalem, were in a terrible state. And it was breaking his heart. So when he began to ask for permission to go back, um, it was like th that book tells you the phases that he went through. And I want to talk about three of those phases this morning. There was a survey phase. Nehemiah knew he had to go back and see what needed to be done so that he could call the people together to do it. There was an own it phase. Even though he was living in luxury, he may have been in captivity, but he was still in a luscious palace. He considered that his problem, not just the people that had been left in shambles. And he also had a strategic planning phase. So when you look at the survey phase, you will notice that he saw broken walls that had left a lot of shame, especially in those days, a city without walls was, was, it was like, I don't know what to compare it to today, but it was very shameful. The girls we serve, the walls in their life of protection have been broken down. The city had the burn gates and left them defenseless. So many of these young girls, this past year we had 87 juveniles referred to us. And time after time after time, there were those defenseless openings in their lives. A lot of it, it this day and age, has to do with social media. And then there was also the, um, the shambles that he saw. And you know when something's left completely in shambles, it's not as simple as going in and building straight away. There's a cleanup that has to be done. And so he saw those shambles that had to be cleaned up and then the building that had to be taken place. So that's a costly repair. There's some builders in the room, I think, that would agree with me. It's, sometimes it's harder to go back in and, and do some of these things to have to be undone before you can build again. And that's kind of like the lives of our girls. There has been so much distrust, so much hurt, and so much fear. Didn't y'all appreciate that worship this morning? Um, I don't know the name of all the praise team, but wherever Steve's at, that worship was awesome. And it, there was, there, our girls are constantly having to overcome fear. I've got a young girl right now that um, she was listening to, um, it was not the song that we sang this morning, but she was listening to the song, Fear is a Liar. And she texted Walt and I one night and she said, I'm, I'm really struggling. She said, this song is really precious to me, but it takes me back to a day that I walked into my home and found a noose around my mother's neck. And um, she said, I am just, I'm really struggling tonight. And uh, this young girl now is facing another fear because the perpetrator is about to go on trial. And she's about to graduate high school. So she's got a lot of things that we're praying that God will help walk her through because um, she's battled fear now for about three years in a strong, strong way. And this kind of music, it ministers. That night that Fear is a Liar was ministering to her. So if you think about it, if you'll lift up this young girl as she's walking through these next couple of months. But um, after we surveyed, after we began to survey in a similar fashion, we think that Nehemiah did, we found out that on a global scale, that sex trafficking was a $39 billion industry the snapshot year that this was taken. To put it in perspective, that was more than Google, Walmart, and McDonald's combined brought in that year. Staggering. I call that shambles, wouldn't you? And so then you bring it down to a state level. In Georgia, Atlanta is sometimes talked about as being the number one city for sex trafficking in the U.S. I like to go with a more conservative uh, data that says it's one of the top 14 cities, which is bad enough. But what we're seeing in Augusta is that a lot of times these girls are being sold on circuits, and they'll be sold in Atlanta, and then they'll be brought through Augusta and up to Columbia and up the eastern seaboard. And um, that we've had a number of the girls that that has happened to. But the statistics tell us in Georgia there's 12,400 men in a given month who purchase sex with a young female in Georgia, an underage female. And then there's two to 300 girls a month that are sold. And that talks about the circuits on that slide. Now you bring it down to a local level. Walt has a background of um, an experience in training in digital media. So with some of his Google analyst, uh, analytics in August of 2017, he started uh, researching keywords. 
And there was a website at that time. It, thankfully, it has been taken now. It was seized by the FBI about 18 months ago. But at that time, it was operational globally. So, But he was doing a keyword search for the CSRA and found that 40,000 searches were made with that um, website keyword in it just in the CSRA in a 30-day period, 40,000. Again, that was a staggering number that that many people were looking at a website where it's primarily known for selling sex and underage girls. One of the girls who was rescued from that and was discovered on National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is another young girl. She's, she's, eight, she's supposed to graduate this year, and she's struggling right now because she's become an orphan during this process of trying to heal. So she's another one of our young girls um, that's really seeking. She's asking God a lot of questions, and we are walking with her through that, that process and pointing her to him because I can't take her fear away but we know the one who can. So we're praying that God will help her put her in a family so that she's no longer an orphan. Again, this worship has meant so much this morning that's touched on those things. Um, so then let's go to the on it phase. So Nehemiah, he did not exclude himself from the pain and suffering that his people were suffering. He, he included himself in the prayer of repentance, like God, forgive us for what we've done. Forgive us for what we haven't done. One of the young women that came to me, um, she was 14 years old. You'll see her, I can't show you their picture, but I have a partial picture of her where we celebrated her graduation at the end. And she prayed and um, or she asked me, where was God when this was happening to me? And, you know, we talked about the fall and sin. And then we talked about our, us being obedient and listening to God. I had to own the fact that maybe my ear wasn't to the ground. Maybe I had, I had not prayed that prayer for sure. Break my heart for what breaks yours, God. Maybe I missed something. I had to sit with her through her pain and said, maybe if I had been obedient, more obedient two years ago when you were going through this, maybe it could have made a difference. I don't know, but I'm here now, and so is God. And so she's a brilliant girl. She asks lots of good questions. And so every week in Bible study, my lady that leads the, um, the work portion of what we do, she would call me and tell me the next question. So she, she's trying to own her own faith and asking lots of hard questions because uh, she was actually trafficked by someone in her family. Um, so what, this is what Nehemiah said. He said, when he was speaking with the Jews, the priests, and the nobles and officials, he included himself in their distress, in his people's distress by saying, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste. It's obvious that his heart was broken by what was breaking God's heart in that moment. Does it break your heart to know that there are children in our, in our community that are being bought and sold similar to the way we would order a pizza? And what we have seen repeatedly over these last 18 months to two years is that the digital factor has really risen to the top of how children are being groomed. Time and again, they've met someone online. And when I'm in our trainings, I, I tell during that period that Rich was talking about, our, my dad died shortly after he and Faye got married. I was incredibly lonely. She was out of the home, then my dad died. So it was my brother and my mother and myself. And any feelings I had, I could write in a journal, tuck them safely away. And the, my greatest danger of anyone finding out what was in there was my little brother that liked to taunt me. But now, no matter what's going on in a kid's life, those feelings are going out on social media a lot of times. And the perpetrators who are on there know how to zero in on that. They know how to exploit that and become whatever they're sharing on social media. And this, this, is, kind of, this is what we wanted y'all to be aware of today. From the time we started until now, the face of it has changed drastically. And uh, Walter's going to come up and talk to you a little bit more about the demand side of it. So as an organization, uh, we began to look at uh, the demand and what's driving this this demand side and you know it's basically a perfect storm um, so we were looking at all the different factors and as Ginger was just relating to you uh, this is huge this is huge and you know I, I tell people we do a digital training class actually and I tell people how many of you and I see a bunch of young people over here 
Uh, would your mom give you the car keys or your dad give you the car keys at 15 and they never got in the car with you or at 16 and you just got that driver's license and they never taught you the roadway and the signs and you better stop here and slow down here or whatever. You, probably a lot worse than that if it was me teaching my kids because they can relate to that. But how many of you would just hand your kids the car keys and say, have at it, go for it, drive? Any show of hands? Not a person. But so many times, out of not thinking about it because it's so accepted and it is part of our culture, we'll hand them the phone with no direction, with no apps to protect them, with no anything, and then we're surprised when they get on sites that they're not supposed to, that they get in chat rooms that they should never be in, that they do things like that. We've got to protect our children here. And so, so the rise and, and the perfect storm is due to this technology, the smartphones, the accessibility of the Internet, and the anonymity of the Internet. As I was telling the earlier crowd, you know, on the Internet, I can be a young, good-looking man. And I've never been a young, good-looking man. So, I mean, what can you do about that? I could be that on the Internet. And then the fact that there's so many kids in our society that are what we call throwaway kids. You know, their parents, they don't pay attention to what they're doing. They're not looking at what's going on in their lives. You know, I get questioned every day because of this ministry. We have two young boys with us, and Skylar, who's not here, he's at a, a church event this weekend, but he's constantly asking me, Dad, when can I get this? Uh, I have an app on his phone called Castito. When can you take that Castito off my phone? And I say, never. I mean, you know, that's just not going to happen. You've got to be protected. Or when can I have a Snapchat account? Or when can... No is okay. No is okay to say no. It's all right to say no to them. Because we're protecting them. We have to respond. We have to take ownership of these things. As a society, we have to take ownership. As a church, New Hope, thank you so much that you are taking ownership. When I hear this, how you're giving to five continents and you're giving to local ministries and all of these things, you're doing something and you're making a difference. And I thank the Lord so much for that. And then personally, in our families, we have to do that. So... Uh, when I think about that, and, and Pastor Bowen was telling the story earlier of uh, Ginger and myself, uh, and so he didn't tell some of these stories about a dating story, so I'll have to tell you all a dating story. Now, it was prior to these. I know most of you all don't think that, that it was ever prior, especially some of you young people, but there were no cell phones around at this time. And we just, I forget what it was, some, it was actually some church event. We were going to Orangeburg, South Carolina, and Ginger's curfew to get back to their house was midnight. And so we left that night, and it was one of those rainy, terrible nights. And of all things, I ran into the back of a car. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? And I tell the man, there was no damage to his. It was a bigger truck, and we were in a little Volkswagen bug, and it was pretty crunched on the front. And I said, sir, do you want to call the police? He said, I am the chief of police of Orangeburg, South Carolina. I said, well, I guess there's no need to call the police. So anyway, that was not starting out to be a good night. And so here we were, because of that and all those other things, we ended up coming late for curfew. And I said there was none of these. That's why I say she couldn't pick up the phone and say, hey, we're going to be late. So when we get there, I think it was probably about 1230, and she says, I'm not going to knock on the door and waking my sister and my brother-in-law up. I'm just not going to do that. I'm going to sit. They had a carport. I'm going to sit in the car. I said, I can't leave you in the car sitting here in the middle of the night. I can't do that. Well, you're not getting in the car with me. And I said, Okay, well, then I will sit on the hood of this car until they come. So I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at my watch. It's like 1 o'clock. By this time, you know, I'm getting tired. So I lay back on the hood of the car, and I'm stretched out, and I fall sound asleep. And I'm just asleep. But I was awakened very suddenly by this sound. Rich, go get the gun! Go get the gun! Because Faye had come to the door and looked out the door and saw me stretched out on the hood of this car. She probably thought I was shot. And I wonder why she thought I was shot. She would go holler to get the gun and shoot me again. I don't know. But she was saying, go get the gun. That's what I tell that story to say this. We as society, we as New Hope Worship Center, we as I care we as individual families, 
We've got to sound the alarm just as she did. Sound the alarm to say, it's not okay that you're selling our kids. It's not okay. Our kids are not for sale. These ladies are wearing this shirt. It's not all right because we are children of God and this is a problem that the church itself should stand up against. We don't expect the government or anybody else to to manage or, or get rid of this problem but we expect the Lord Almighty to raise up a standard against the enemy. That's what we expect. And so we've got to get involved. We've got to do our part. So as Ginger was talking about the story of Nehemiah, and I've got to put my eyes on because I'm blind even when I made this, this uh, print big. I still can't see it, so put my glasses on. Uh, as she was saying in Nehemiah, the story goes on, and, and Nehemiah formulated a plan, and that plan, plan was this. It was a simple plan. He said everybody needed to have a vested interest. And by that, what he did is he took the people who were on the wall in this spot and what was behind them, they had to fix and rebuild that wall behind them. And so that's what the Lord is calling us to do, is we all must get involved. We all must do our part. And we do our part at I Care through a three-pronged approach. Ginger's already told you it's prevention, it's intervention, and it's restoration. Prevention, we're doing just what we're doing now. We're going to churches. We're going to businesses at Masters. We usually go to the airport and we do trainings at the airport. We're teaching those people what to look for uh, when these young girls may be coming in. We're bringing about awareness. We're addressing the demand side uh, from a digital standpoint, and we're working at that. And then on the intervention side, we've got a short video that I will pull this out of the way so you can see that gives you a good overview of our intervention side. I Care serves women and children from all walks of life. Some are running from abusive situations at home. Others are enticed by strangers over social media. These aren't people on the other side of the world. They're your neighbors. They go to your kids' schools, shop at your favorite stores, and sit beside you in your movie theater. They are being bought and sold for sex daily. And that is why I Care exists. To stabilize these women and children, and to organize a community that responds to their needs. To do this, we work on many different levels, prevention, intervention, and restoration. So what does intervention typically look like? Eye care gets a referral about a potential victim. Sometimes the child is in need of an emergency safe home. While in this crisis stabilization phase with eye care, we work with community partners for medical and dental care, while providing the basic necessities of food, clothing, and safe home with trained staff and caring volunteers. We provide case management and develop an individualized care plan based on each client's goals and dreams. The typical time frame for this crisis care phase is 10 to 14 days, requiring up to 30 volunteers who donate as many as 336 hours per client. Is it worth it, you ask? The answer comes in whispers from clients who say things like, I've experienced more love in these past several days than I've experienced my whole life. We think she's totally worth it. Do you? Become an I Give monthly partner today. So that kind of gives a good picture of the intervention piece that we do. We take these ladies, we may get a call from, let's say we get a call from the FBI, and they say, we're going to run a sting operation on Thursday night. Will you guys be available? We are, so they may pick up a lady or two, and they will go to intervention uh, with us. Uh, We were using a, a, a lady's home, and she moved out of state, which kind of ruined our plan there for a little bit, but we were praying, and like God is so faithful, he gave us even a better situation now that we have a place called the Caring Cottage, uh, which this is uh, the inside of the bedroom at Caring Cottage, and so it's a wonderful place that we can come and bring these young ladies in for a week to two weeks, three weeks, uh, that we'll be able to take care of them, assess where they're at, they get medical attention, they get counseling, they get dental if they need it. All of those things are provided by wonderful community partners that we have, and just really by the, by the Lord, that's who provides it. Really, it's by the Lord who provides that. And so that's what we're able to do. As Ginger already said, we had 87 referrals last year. In case you wonder if this is needed, it's hugely needed. Uh, so that is 
the intervention phase. And then last uh, is our restoration phase. And so in restoration and really even in the intervention, we're providing these young ladies with education, parenting, life skills. Uh, you know, we're, we're just branching out because you can't take them out of that lifestyle and not give them a hope and give them a future. You've got to give them, and in fact, that's what we call it, hope for her future. And that side, they're, they're having case managers, they're having mentors, and they're being taught job skills. Uh, they make soaps, they make organic soaps, and we're able to sell those soaps. Uh, Kudos just called me the other day and said, hey, we're out of those soaps. We need some more of those soaps. Wonderful problem to have. And so... Uh, those are the kind of things that they're learning in the restoration phase. But even equally and more exciting, probably, uh, if you'll switch the next one, probably uh, Columbia County Building Department. Uh, Reagan, you could probably appreciate this. They probably think I'm the longest uh, running uh, building permit out there. Because uh, <laughs> I think we've been in this building stage for a little over three years now, but that's okay because this is a 7,000 square foot house on 16 acres that God, when it is finished here in the next, I would say, 45 to 60 days, we're in that finishing stages, we will have a several hundred thousand dollar facility that God has paid for completely. It's debt free. So we are thankful for that. And this provides uh, inside here, uh, this provides rooms. We'll be able to keep five, six, seven women and their children, uh, and they will come for a long-term uh, placement, uh, usually 12 to 18 months, and there's zero cost to them. And I, I just want to share just a minute. I know we're running pretty close on time, but I was going to share just a minute. Rich was talking about how God has performed miracle after miracle, and he has. Because when this was birthed in our hearts, this restoration home, about five years ago, we were looking at this land, and we had started raising a little money for it. Uh, and so we were still many thousands of dollars away, but we were looking at the land, and we'd go out there regular, and we'd pray about it. We'd say, boy, we love this land. We feel like God's holding it for us. And I'd talk to the gentleman who uh, owned it, and uh, I said, please don't sell it. You know, if you get a serious offer, let me know because I will try to figure out what we got to do. I don't want to go to the bank. So anyway, he calls me one weekend and he says, well, I haven't got an official offer, but uh, a guy tells me he's getting ready to make an offer. I said, okay, let me, let me see what I can do. Let me see what I can do. And I guess probably within a day or two, and you lose track of time, so I couldn't, I'm not trying to tell you wrong, but it was very quick. I had a church pastor from Aiken, South Carolina, call me and said, hey, can I come out there and look at that land? I said, sure, we don't own it yet, but you can look at it with us. And we go out there, and there's this, I wish I had a picture of it, but out past that deck, there's a creek out there, and there's a little wooden bridge over the creek. And so he comes, and he's standing on there, and he said, how much do you need to finish, uh, be able to purchase this land? And we gave him the number. It was over $30,000. And he said, we'll have you a check next week. Go ahead and buy that land. And so... Uh, but God wasn't finished there. This whole property is a miracle because right after that, we had a gentleman contact us and said, I do site clearing, and I want to come do the site clearing for you. And I said, okay, we want to dig a basement and all of those things. So he said, that's all right. I got big equipment. I'll have it out there next week, and we'll be starting. I said, well, before we do that, you know that because of the creek. Uh, Reagan would know this. Oh, my goodness, you have to have that double silt fence. And I think this stuff's pretty expensive. And, he, and I said, well, let me see if I can get that lined up to get my silt fence up. And he said, Don't, you missed what I said. I'll have the silt fence put up. I'm taking care of it. And it's zero cost to the minister. And right after that, and we got the basement dug, we had a group out of Atlanta that called us and said, hey, we call ourselves the Builders for Christ. Will you please send me those house plans? And we said, sure. And we sent them the house plans, and they said, I'm going to bring a group of 50 people in, and we're going to frame that house for you in one week's time. Now, you got to have all the materials set, but I'll get it framed for you. I said, 7,000 square feet? You're going to frame it in one week? It was the most fun week I can remember spending. It was like an Amish barn raising. I mean, you know, they got out there, and that thing is 78 feet long, and they built the long walls on both sides, and then they raised them up. I got video of it. I wish I could have showed you raising those walls up. And in one week's time, that thing was framed and decked and had the tar paper rolled out on it, and it was just an unbelievable sight. And then we had an electrician who came along and said, hey, guess what? I want to provide all the electrical work, 
and supplies for you, and I'll take care of that. And he did. And so it's just been, you know, we've paid for some things, but I would say 80% of this house is built labor free. 80% of this house. Uh, there's a lot of church groups who come out and uh, all the siding was put on by uh, church groups and different things like that. So just miracle after miracle after miracle, which tells me one thing. God wants to see this house built. And he wants to see this place for these women and these children to have a safe place that they can come and a safe spot for they can come and they can heal and they can receive the love of the Lord. That's what he wants to see. And I'm so thankful that he let us be just a tiny part of it uh, because it's not Ginger or myself or Linda or any of, although they, done, they do tons of work, hours and hours and hours of work. But it's Jesus who's doing the work. It's him who's doing the healing. It's him who's doing the transformation. It's him who provides the budget. And there are days, hey, we, we try to figure out we're a small ministry. Well, I don't know how we're going to get the money. Like that caring cottage, we had to pick up, I'll just tell this real quick, we had to pick up like $1,400 a month uh, in extra expense to, to open that caring cottage. And we had a church that contacted us and said, you know what, we want to sponsor that this next year. We'll take on that for you guys to be able to have that safe place. So thank you, Lord Jesus, because you are the provider. You take care of us. Uh, his faithfulness, his faithfulness is just beyond. Ginger wants to talk about one other thing there. I think there may be one final slide because, uh, you know, we did talk about a lot of dark things as far as the girls were concerned, but it's so wonderful to sit with them in the happy celebration moments of their life. And this was... Uh, this little girl came to us at 14, uh, and she was pregnant, and uh, she graduated. She graduated high school and had finished her first semester of community college at the same time she had graduated. So that's her little boy at the bottom, and there she is with us. And even the dress that this little girl wore, she was not in a tremendous need of clothes, but when it came to dressing up for her graduation, she did have a need. And there was a... Tina, I think it was one of the dresses that Tina had donated to us that was brand new. And we pulled it out and we said, do you think this will work? She went in the bathroom and tried it on. It fit her perfectly. She looked beautiful. And so she walked down her graduation aisle feeling so good about finishing school, but also that God was providing her needs. So she's still pursuing her degree in nursing. And um, that is just a wonderful, um, and the ladies provided that beautiful little celebration for her. So it was just a wonderful, some of the same ladies had showered her when the baby was born and walked her through until she graduated. So just wonderful moments like that. And it's because God is working through his people. The name of the house is River Tree. And it's from the scripture in Ezekiel 47 that talks about the water that flows from the throne of God, bringing healing to wherever it goes. And uh, it's, it's, he provides, he, pro he provides the sustenance and he provides the healing.